Thank you so much. Good afternoon. Thank you for coming to my lecture recital entitled From Bochum, excuse me, From Berlin to Bochum, the influences that have led to Bochum's unique style. Today, I'll discuss the impact that both the modernism movement and the golden age of American song have had on Bochum's creative style within his vocal compositions. I'll also demonstrate how his musical versatility as a performer has also been an integral feature in the development of his iconic sound. He is now recognized as one of the most versatile and respected American contemporary composers living today. Researching William Bogum has been such an enlightening experience for me. I've always had a connection with him, uh, primarily because he's never been one to hide the fact that his musical journey has included an equal combination of popular and serious music. In fact, he's quite honored to have had that experience and feels it's necessary for all musicians to embrace music as a whole rather than defining themselves into a restrictive label. Beginning in the early 20th century, these genres of music started to be labeled as lowbrow and highbrow art forms. Popular, labeled as lowbrow or inferior, and serious, labeled as highbrow or sophisticated. It's important to note that these labels were only recognized and considered and labeled from the highbrow perspective. Personally, as a musician, I have felt torn between my interest in serious and popular music. There were multiple times during my formative years when I was strongly persuaded and questioned by my peers and instructors about the music that I listened to or played in my free time or even performed. It hasn't been until recently that I've discovered how important it is as an instructor and a student to embrace it all. Needless to say, I'm an advocate for changing this narrative so that all composers and music are equally represented without the restrictive labels. If art really is for art's sake, then let's fully embrace that. Bochum was born in 1938, so being surrounded by popular songs and educated in modernism subconsciously started forming his own musical palette. My lecture will give an overview of specific musical influences and examples from both the modernist and golden age genres and how he has incorporated these values into his own career as a performer and composer. To give a well-rounded representation of this, I have chosen to perform three Berlin songs and a selection of songs from four of Bochum's major vocal works. Being that he was taking lessons during the Great Depression, his parents couldn't afford to pay for lessons. Fortunately, when he was eight years old, he was awarded a scholarship to pay for the tuition to study at the University of Washington in Seattle. In order to continue taking lessons, he had to earn the rest of the tuition money himself. He did this by playing in every kind of dance band, played at various stag parties, and performed in burlesque houses on Saturday nights, followed by Sunday morning church services. He jokingly says that his non-judgmental in interest in different <coughs> kinds of music is the result of this skewed musical background. His formal training began with structural classical training with a taste of popular music. John Burrell at the University of Washington, who he considers his primary teacher, was the first to pique his interest in the modernist compositional techniques. By the time Bochum was in his 20s, he was rooted in the American popular song culture while totally wrapped up with the modernist, chromatic, and atonal, atonal writing values that modernism was, was about. During this time, he was studying modernist techniques with Darius Mio and Oliver Messian at the Paris Conservatory, which was also when he was in, introduced to ragtime, particularly Uli Blake and Scott Joplin. This genre, broadened his perspective and reinvigorated his creativity and interest in the Golden Age era. He started connecting simple melodies and harmony to more complex forms of music. He's very grateful that Mio was open-minded and encouraged his students to discover their own style. Mio's philosophy was that as long as a composer has a solid foundation in form and harmony, there was never just one way of composing. While his contemporaries such as Boulez and Stockhausen were climbing to levels of higher sophistication and abstraction, Bolcom was laying the foundation for what was to become his own innovative style that connected high 
and low art forms within his vocal works. He was viewing music through an incredibly wide lens, but was living kind of two separate lives of innovation and nostalgia. Before he began his tenure as professor of composition at the University of Michigan in 1973, Bochum went through a transformational decade, much like America did in the 1920s, when modernism and the golden age of American popular song was developing simultaneously. If the transformation the 1920s was creating labels, then Bolton's transformation of the 1950s, we'll say, was dissolving them. Eventually, he focused his wide lens and realized that there was more to discover than the exclusivity of chromatic-based writing that had been discovered within the modernist movement. There were many values and philosophical differences between modernism and the golden age of American popular song. Modernism, was a time when composers were dissociating themselves with traditional tonal practices. They focused on establishing new musical perspectives through entirely new means and methods of expression, as well as new techniques of musicianship. To achieve this, composers were reinventing the canon by using altered forms of tonality, challenging traditional rhythmic patterns, and augmenting the range of instrumentation in size and melodic range. One of the most famous techniques that developed was the 12-tone method, which means that all 12 notes of the chromatic scale must be used within the piece before they can be repeated again. This method created a lot of ambiguity in form and lacked any tonal center. As a result, it also created a lack of connection with their audience, but they really didn't care. Their only concern was about thinking forward and about who was going to be recognized and invent the best thing and be recognized for it in the canon. So innovation was the main goal. Composers who have been recognized in the canon and have also been major influences on Volcom are Arnold Schoenberg, Igor Stravinsky, and Charles Ives. Here is the first musical example of how these values of modernism impacted Volcom. As you listen, you'll hear the use of extended tonality, and chromaticism that doesn't let your ear predict any sort of chordal progression or, or cadence. This is Over the Piano from his volume one set of cabaret songs. The songs are characterized with having lush harmonies, lyrical creativity, as well as the inclusion of the black American culture. Psychologically, these songs promoted patriotism and enhanced emotional connection during a time of war and financial instability. The aspects such as emotional and cultural connection, beautiful harmonies and inclusion characterized them into what we know into, in music history as the minor canon classification. Now, we all know that there are two sides to every story, and thankfully, Bochum listened to both of those sides to begin the ascent to, let's call the neutral or the labelless category. It is evident that there is no hidden agenda when listening to these songs. Their messages are stories about heritage, they offer their gratitude for the freedom that our country provides, 
and often acted as propaganda tools to promote ways of supporting soldiers and families during wartime. This compositional style was also innovative in its own way by setting the standard for all musicals that came after them. Some of the most famous musicals and songs we know are, were composed during this time. Bochum's decision to perform as well as compose has set him apart from other composers of his time. Bochum found a lot of freedom and enjoyment performing his own works as well as music from the Golden Age. In fact, Bochum was encouraged by his contemporaries and mentors that his focus should be on composing and that he no longer needed to perform. To that, he completely disagreed. Leaving a performing career felt very unnatural to him, seeing as how many of the great composers in the past performed their own works as well as their contemporaries' works. While much of his performance inspiration is derived from the Golden Age in some way, shape, or form, it was his collaborations with Arnold Weinstein that really taught him the art of setting poetry and prose to music. Weinstein's style of writing beautifully lends itself towards a natural musical inflection. Arnold Weinstein is an American-born writer and poet who often describes himself as a theater poet and is really best known for his collaborations with Bochum. An article in the New York Times tells of a time when Weinstein was living in Florence, Italy, when Darius Mule learned of his libretto, A Comedy of Horrors. While Mule loved it, he felt that it was too American for his taste and passed it off to his American student, who was William Bochum. And to put it in golden year terms, this partnership was the beginning of a beautiful friendship and a lifelong collaboration between them. More than half of Bochum's vocal songs are set to Weinstein's text. In 1963, Bochum set music to Weinstein's libretto, which became Dynamite Tonight, their first of three operas for actors. I have to say that I've never heard of the term opera for actors until I began my research on Bochum. He describes them in this way because of the style of singing that is required of the vocalist. Bochum reflects that at the time he wrote his first opera, for actors, he preferred actors over singers because of the quality of singing and their style of learning. He felt that there was no difference between their speaking and singing voices. In other words, he could understand what they were saying, unlike his experience with opera singers at the time. Chronologically speaking, this was right about the time that Bochum was dissociating himself with the modernist ideals. As a result of this separation, this opera stylistically present, represents the Golden Age era in tonality, its connection to the audience, and is also modeled after the Marx Brothers style of a drama jocoso, which means drama with jokes. This opera is described by critics as an anti-war satire, but to Bochum and Weinstein, they did not see it as criticizing the American people or their sacrifices. As you listen to this next example, Notice the use of vocal scoops in, into notes, glottal stops when beginning phrases with a vowel, varied tone quality, and shortened vowel duration. All of these characteristics that I mentioned make the English language better to understand when singing. You'll also see that Bochum use, often uses the leaps of a tenth interval in the piano part. This is a short example here, but this entire song is filled with them. It's a, it's a big stretch for the hand, so it's important that the pianist feels the lilt, but still maintains the forward motion without getting stuck. Met in 1972 in New York City, 
while performing songs in a concert honoring Rodgers and Hart. She's been hailed for bringing elegance, simplicity, humor, and a mix of edgy rasp and nostalgic theater tonal qualities in her voice that heightens the stories she tells. To that high praise, she gives all the credit to the original ones who wrote the songs. By 1974, they released their first best-selling album, After the Ball, a treasury of turn-of-the-century popular songs. Since then, they have entertained audiences for decades, performing his own works as well as jazz standards from his favorite minor canon artists, Ira and George Gershwin, ragtime members from Ubi Blake, Broadway musical standards from both Cole Porter and Irving Berlin. He refers to these guys as the Big Five. Bochum said in the New York Times that he is, quote, interested in showing how different elements relate. My music tries to make the relationships clear. The more I look to the future of music, the more I keep coming back to the past, end quote. Let's listen to him perform I Got Rhythm, just to hear the style. Irving Berlin. After all, he is considered the father of the golden age of American song. Berlin is someone who spearheaded this era and has left a remarkable impact on Bochum's vocal works style. He is a perfect example of someone who fits the mold of a composer in the golden age. He was a Russian immigrant who began entertaining when he was just eight years old as a street performer and singing waiter in the New York City streets. Everything he learned, he learned by rote, which means he learned by ear. He composed his first hit, Alexander's Ragtime Band, when he was just 23 years old. That was the first of more than 800 songs, surpassing Schubert's 600 hits, if you want to call them hits. Some of the songs you may recognize, most of which are so popular that we forget who actually wrote them. Most of these songs were taken from either his 19 Broadway musical productions or his 18 scores for Hollywood films. Songs like Cheek to Cheek, Blue Skies, God Bless America, Putting on the Ritz, so many more. That last one I thought was actually a 1982 original by an 80s band named Taco. However, I was only five, so what did I know? I eventually figured it out. Throughout Bochum's career, he was, fortunately to, he was fortunate to work with many composers of the Golden Age era and reminds us that with classical music, one has to go on written description or what teachers tell us. With a lot of this music referencing the Golden Age, it's possible to hear it and be taught by someone who knows the original style. This brings me to a very important point about Bochum's preferred tone and articulations that he desires for vocalists to consider when performing his music. I'd like to highlight some of Bochum's performance practices, practice suggestions that are typically for vocalists. His intention is not for a vocalist to have a pure operatic tone quality, but rather an expressive quality that requires a vocalist to be versatile in their tone to reflect the genre the music represents. So number one, diction, diction, diction. Generally, in classical singing, Singing with a proper tone is equally as important as understanding the story. However, for both of them, he specifically intends his music to be sung in a vocalist range that allows for a combination of spoken and sung text. In this case, a proper tone shouldn't ever hinder the storyline. Critics marveled at Marvel, or Morris's diction. To that, she says, quote, where did it ever get accepted that when you get up on stage in opera, you don't have to convince people the same way just because it's a familiar song, end quote. Number two, flexibility. Flexibility as an artist is essential no matter what style we study or perform. Flexibility begins with trial and error, or ad lib, which was an integral part of Bochum's foundation and coincidentally Berlin's too. 
Mio's philosophy for composers was to find their own style through a solid foundation of harmony and form. Volcom's philosophy for performers is to find their own style through a solid foundation of form and harmony so that they can allow themselves to listen outside of the written notes. In his vocal works, more often than not, the pianist and vocalist are not expected to play the exact notes on the page. It's understood that the written music is an outline from, from which to elaborate. It is the responsibility of the pianist to create the rhythmic drive for the singer, which is not always written on the page. With this said, if pianists approach Bochum's music in a robotic attempt to follow the rules that are, listed, that are on the page, the effect of Bochum will be lost. For example, in classical music, a waltz is felt in a big one. It's three, four times. Sometimes it's felt in three, sometimes it's felt in a big one. Four, four time can be felt like a march or a slow two. In popular music, the emphasis is on beats two and four, which is often referred to as playing in the pocket. I can tell you that the emphasis is not on one and three. And I encourage you to tap your toe or tap quietly on your lap on one and three, and then try it on two and four as you listen to this example to feel the difference in your body. What is more comfortable or natural to you? Here's an example. the ability to freely reduce the score and ad lib in order to support the singer as well as adding notes and changing the rhythms during his solo to create a full orchestral sound that it originally was written for that is beyond what is printed. Pianists have to reduce orchestral, orchestral scores all the time by listening to the original instrumentation. This is no different. You'll notice that her lyrical rhythm is not even but rather is the rhythm of the spoken word. The ends of her words, whether they are consonants or vowels, are enunciated, and most times she doesn't hold out the vowel for the full length. Heaven forbid that we don't that we don't keep the, the, the full vowel to the end of the phrase, or to the end of the note, excuse me. One final thing, her unashamed use of triphthongs and diphthongs. After all, it is the American way of speaking. She's singing like she would tell a story. I've looked extensively to try to find his versions of these songs, and I just don't think that they are in print. I think they are only in his head. In fact, it's confirmed that it's only in his head. In an interview with Bruce Duffy, he comments that the connection he has with his audience gives him inspiration as a composer. 
His performances will never be no perfect, but it will always offer a special level of raw humanity. His compositional style would have resulted in something very different if he had decided not to perform and appreciates the energy that he gains from Morris, the Golden Age era, and his audiences. To an extent, Bochum learned many of the Golden Age styles by rote himself, just by being surrounded by it and allowing himself to think outside of the written notes. In doing so, he knows the importance of lifting off the musical energy off the page. He's incorporated many of the dance rhythms, syncopations, and various genres of music, and encourages this same freedom of ad-lib in his own works. This is evident in his cabaret songs that were written between 1977 and 1983. This set was a monumental accomplishment for Bogo and Weinstein. Before I begin talking about the next song, let's first define what cabaret is. It started as an underground variety show that can include dancing, singing, comedy acts, and theater, usually hosted by an MC. Let's be honest, it's really just a result of jazz and poetry secretly hanging out together in French bars beginning in the late 19th century. Amour comes from the first of the two volumes of his cabaret songs. This song is a great analogy of what could possibly represent the lowbrow, highbrow conflict in scholarship and the hopeful resolution within the relationships of the characters in the song. These characters' descriptions are solely based on the differences between the values of the Golden Age era and modernism. It starts with a policeman, creating an uproar when he gets incredibly distracted by a risque woman in the street at a traffic stop, which represents the Golden Age. She was noticed by everyone from street workers to high food and philosophers. Her disruption led to court, which is modernism, but the judge couldn't even find it in his heart to charge her of anything because he could see that she brought a sense of joy to everyone she met. So if the woman represents the golden age and the court represents modernism, then Bochum has to represent the discerning jury members or possibly the dissolution of labels. However, in reality, Bochum never wanted to be labeled as a crossover composer. In doing so, he feels it somehow honors the labels that are already in place. The fact is that his cabaret songs do connect the major and minor canon through relatable stories, extended tonality and chromaticism, interracial rhythmic dance qualities and theatrical interplay between the pianist and vocalist. Upon completing the cabaret songs, he and Weinstein found another opportunity to produce their third opera for actors. Casino Paradise was their third opera for actors written between 1983 and 1990 and is based off a book by Arnold Weinstein and Thomas Babe. Overall, it is about attempting to bring down a big, ruthless business tycoon. For Bochum and Weinstein, it's about the history of America and about the nostalgia for an era that has passed. A Great Man's Child is a song from the opera that references the philosophy of the baby boomer time in America when families were growing exponentially. The parents of the baby boomers who were World War I children and eventually had a part in the military during World War II were all too familiar with the hardship and made sure that their kids wanted for nothing. The music is fully inspired by the Golden Age era with its ragtime inspired rhythms, cabaret-like instrumentation, and styled after George M. Cohan's musical comedies in which the story is simple and direct through a mixture of dialogue and singing. Most of this song is spoken and also varies in dynamics depending on the emotional status of the, of the character. The dialogue contains most of the story, so the pianist has to constantly be aware of balance, timing, rhythmic diversity, and tone that reflects what the character is saying or singing. This score was originally written for seven, instru seven instrumentalists that included two keyboards for added effect and would normally have a conductor. But when reducing the piano part to 10 fingers, the pianist has two jobs the conductor, and the pianist. You'll hear these influences in this example. I done side swiped and new wiped and moon swept and talked down and lied to and danced on. On my way to the various musical spots in India and points east. Only to find the east is moved to the west. Oh, I fed the needy, scrubbed the city, and did the nasty I told them if they were going to die, was there anything I could do for them? 
but there is always a hint of nostalgia in his vocal works, whether it's inspired by literature, music, or theater from the Golden Age. It's like the saying goes, you can take the boy out of the Golden Age genre, but you can't take the Golden Age genre out of the boy. I'll wrap up my defense with Bolcom having the final say. He says, quote, I see composers who try to deny some part of their background. Most of them are trying to just say goodbye to that whole life, which I can understand. But at some time, at the same time, it's part of their lives. I say to them that they're going to have to come to terms with every part of their life because if they don't, at some point it will come bang, right up in their face and they won't be able to deal with it in any realistic sort of way. So I try to find a way for them to integrate their own lives with their own experience because when they do this, they will end up with something that is truly theirs." End quote. Thank you so much for being here for my lecture recital and I hope you enjoy our performance.
But as I passed the church house door, instead of singing Amen, the choir was singing Amor. Oh!
Thank you.